The biggest fear I have right now is in my popularity growth that people are gonna try to be like me. I'm an enigma. I was I was in outer space. I grew up in a very different. Yeah, I grew up. I'm a fir- I was born in the old country. I'm more similar to everybody's grandfather than I am to them. I'm a different animal. Yeah. Don't do it like me. Don't do it like you. Do it like us in our buying into who we were and how we could do it. You got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? Hey everybody, uh, really excited about today's podcast. Uh, Excited about the book, but more excited about the gentleman that's sitting in front of me. Uh, Doug is uh, an iconic, I like using that, iconic uh, uh, businessman and CEO in the corporate world and was at the helm of one of VaynerMedia's earliest clients, Campbell's. Um, and an avid tennis fan, which is one of the first things I think about with him, but somebody I've stayed in touch with over the last decade who I have a lot of respect for, and when him and his team reached out and said, hey, we've got a new book out, we'd love to be on the podcast, I couldn't have been more excited for this moment, and so here we are. LinkedIn community, I know you're watching live. We're taking phone numbers on Facebook where we're live as well. Uh, I'd really like to give some of you access to Doug because I think the wisdom and the experience and the blueprint uh, that he brings to the forefront is a valuable one and I'm excited to give you uh, context. I think a lot of times a lot of the entrepreneurs and executives from this show get enormous value of some of the greats that have done it and uh, I feel like Doug sits in that category and so I'm really excited to see you my friend. It's good to see you too. Doug, why don't you uh, give some context because I do have an audience that I think will be hearing about you for the first time and I'm excited about that. So why don't you give a little two to three minute rant, uh, call it a comic book number one origin story stuff. You can go all the way back to who you were as a kid or going to your professional stuff, but take the floor for three to four minutes for context and we'll take it from there. Sure. Uh, I grew up in a very modest household outside of Chicago. and uh, Were you a Bears fan? Oh, big time. Well, Allen Robinson, the star wide receiver of the Bears, literally just walked out of here two seconds ago. And I missed him. We got to find him. Shrug, go find him. We got to get him for Doug. If he's here, that'd be awesome. Yeah, what's done? We're going to figure it out. I don't think he left. Go ahead, man. We're we're moving. (laughs) Improving early. Quick interruption, just like I like it. If you could get Rizzo or uh, Chris Bryant here, that would be perfect. Well, speaking of Cubs, sports cards are back. And I'm buying Javier Baez rookie cards like crazy. Oh, yeah. I think Javier's a real player. So go ahead. All right. Chicago, so outside I, Chicago. I grew, I grew up in Chicago and uh, uh, migrated to the corporate world very early on. I tried to play professional tennis. That lasted a nanosecond. <laughs> and then discovered I couldn't make any money. Went back, finished my MBA, went, up, went to work in the corporate world. Worked there for 40 years. It's unbelievable. Uh, my first performance review, six months into my job, you know, your boss signs it and the, your boss's boss had to read it, read it and make a comment. My boss's boss on my first performance review. And reviews, real quick, this is an exciting story already. You're six months in. Where are you working? What I'm are you doing? I'm working at General Mills in Minneapolis. And you are large a? Large consumer. I'm in yep. brand management, a large consumer goods company. What brand are you on? I was on Betty Crocker Potato Buds and Specialty Potatoes. I love this stuff. And then I moved on to Betty Crocker Brownies, Puddings, and Pie Crusts. I, I, I did it all there. You were a Betty Crocker but jugger. I was writing the back <laughs> mes- the message on the back panel from Betty Crocker. As Betty all, Crocker. As Betty Crocker. So you my, are Betty Crocker at some point. I was. Yeah. I love this. My mother was in shock. <laughs> she said, what are you doing? I'm saying, I tell her I'm like writing Betty, my Mom. Betty Crocker recipe. I love it. Anyway. So anyway, six months but in. Six months in, I get, I have my first review. And my boss's boss, the only line he writes is, you should be looking for another job. Really? First, you know, and I've moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Don't know a soul. And... It's and cold here, as shit. Yeah, it is. It was March. It was. We had a, first the first eighteen days I lived there. <laughs> the high temperature was below zero. Unbelievable. So, so it's below zero. I'm getting feedback. You should be looking for another job. I don't know anybody. How'd you handle that? Uh, I did all right with it. Good for you. You know, I had. You know, you have two choices. Fold. Uh, yeah. Or fold double down. Or double down. I love and you. I doubled down, and I was grinding it out. What did you learn from that? Well, uh, what's the what's the takeaway from that? Was it about interactions with your boss? Was it did, was there no. some other random insight? I, I what what I learned from that probably was uh, that I could play through it. Mm. Uh, but uh, early on, I was like a deer in the headlights. You mm. know, my first day of work, I went there off the tennis tour, 
and uh, I had a, uh, <laughs> everybody was wearing pinstripe suits, red ties, white shirts. That was sort of the, yeah. this is mid seventies. And, uh, and I show up in a khaki suit with a ye- bright yellow shirt, a big wide Madras tie, uh, and brown earth shoes and a tan line from where I had my headband and uh, my mustache? Fu Manchu mustache. Wow. And here I'm showing up at, at a button-down collar place. And uh, Did anybody make an a adventure. good funny comment in the first 24 hours? No, but I started... The looks. To, I, I will tell you, I started to look like everybody else about three months in. I understand. And I spent probably the first... My entire time there, my focus was on fitting in because my feedback early on was... You're not fitting in, so I was trying. To, I was trying to figure out how to make this work. It was a whole new world. It'd be like walking in here for the first time in your. Yes, the energy here is know, a little different. Wow. <laughs> yes. Steroids. Yes. But uh, at any rate, and I was trying to fit in. Yes, I understand. And I was trying to figure out. Well, Did you like the work? I mean, obviously, staying well, in the industry I like for forty the people. years. You I like, like the, the people. people more than the. I the work was fine. But you and like it the was people part. It was interesting, but the people I like and that. being part of a large community, just like you've got here. Yeah. Being part of a large energy. community, people give each other energy, and if you needed help, you found somebody to help you. Did you like playing doubles, or did you in tennis? You liked more well, of the singles I, aspect. I, I would, both, both. If you're a tennis player, I was better at doubles. But if you're a tennis player, you're sort of a lone yeah. wolf anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's You know, because right. you're it's not a team sport. No. You know, you're you you're playing for yourself. Yeah. But so so. So what I happened spent immediately a lot of time after that? In. Eventually, I got fired from that job. That's epic. Nine years, nine years in, I went in. I was working. I had the world's greatest job. I was director of marketing for Parker Brothers Toys and Games. Oh. Nerf Sports. I had two little kids. Nerf sports, Nerf football, Nerf hoop. The green and Monopoly. white Nerf football is like the most Americana for me because that's how I became a Jets fan. Like the Nerf, spongy, Nerf, green and white football is like one of the most near and dear things to my heart. Well, we all, a lot of us grew up with them. Yep. Yeah, you got yeah, one right. I got you, a little leather no, there, but like that's what little, it looked like. Well, now you've, yeah. you've gone upscale. Well, no, that's But when you started, enough. yeah. Go buy me a Nerf football. I don't want to be known as upscale. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I went into my bosses. I went in to work on a a beautiful spring morning. <laughs> this is now nine years later. Nine years later, up in Boston, and I uh, and the receptionist said, the senior vice president of marketing would like to see you. I go up to his office, and he said, your job's been eliminated. You need to be out of here by noon. Simple as that. And nine years of my career was over in a snap. So real quick, you were at General Mills for how long before you that went to Parker? That was nine years. That, that, they, General Mills owned Parker Brothers. I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Got it. And, and later sold it to Hasbro? Eventually, yeah. Eventually. Well, eventually, they spun it off, and then Hasbro bought it. Yeah. And that's it? So, but, you know, the, the, it was not How easy. How old were you, 30? I was 32. And what, like, crushed? That's, was, a, that, that's that a tough was, one. That was the most devastating yeah, that's a tough day one. of my career. No question. I had, I had, Did you have a mortgage? I had two kids. I had a very large mortgage. <laughs> Uh, it's real and, stuff. You know how 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 am I going to make this so work? The, I had to go home and tell my wife. Yeah, I'm dying. I'm pretty. dying. I'm not to go. Uh, not to completely go into that wound, but like you're a big boy now and had a lot. of Wait till everybody hears. He ended up being the CEO of Campbell. So like he won. But like tell me about tell me about that day. Who'd you call first? I, I'm actually very curious about that. Was a I didn't a call parent? any. But you did. You, you didn't know what to do. You know, I was told you I needed coma. to be out of there by noon. You clean your desk? Yeah, clear your desk, put it in a box. Did you talk to anybody that I, you worked with? No. Because you were just, in a daze. I, 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 yeah, I was absolutely in a daze. Did you go to a bar right after? <laughs> I went straight home. Okay, fair enough. Told People my, do go to To my wife, my two kids, my How old the, the dogs, kids? the cats, and <laughs> How the did the craziness. cats take it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I haven't <laughs> never talked to them about it. But, Nonetheless, uh, it, was, it and was hard. What happened next? Next, uh, later, they were so anxious to get me out of the building, they forgot <laughs> to tell me what my uh, package was. benefit, my, what my package was. So the head of, so one of the HR people called, called me you? and said, I'd like to fill tell, you in. Yeah. And I swore at him and hung up the phone. I, you know, yeah, I was pissed. so pissed. It sort of your, all came out John on McEnroe the phone. John McEnroe came out. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yep, and? And, and, uh, and after about two more hours with my kids running around and the dogs and the cats I thought I need to get a job I better call that guy back so I so enough I, of this home life so I, hours in. I tell you I called him back and that same day and they sent me to an outplacement counselor who saved my life saved my life and that same day I had had the worst experience of my career and I mean that over my 45 year career 
And uh, that, that afternoon, I call my outplacement concert, a guy by the name of Neil McKenna. He answered, this is before cell phones. Yeah. And before caller ID. Of course. He answers the phone, whoever calls him, and he says, hello, this is Neil McKenna. How can I help? And he was there for me completely. I called him. He said, come right on over. We're going to work through this. We've got to focus forward. I, I, I know this is tough Shocking, stuff. Shocking, but yeah. And, uh, and he, he saved my life. He's, wow. You know, in, in, in that moment. And, uh, and, you know, the funny thing was the first thing he had me do, and he, we talked about this right away, he said, I want you to handwrite your entire life story for me and your family story. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I got to get a job. I, you, you know, you know, and you, you, and you want me to write, handwrite. You said, yeah, I want you to handwrite it. I want you to feel this. Handwrite your life story. Everything, everything you can think of. Leave nothing out. So I spent two weeks writing my life. <laughs> I two weeks writing my life. No wonder story. you have a book. But well, you know, when you're unemployed, you have a lot you have of time. time. You have a lot of time. So I, I wrote for two weeks, and it was. And in third grade, Susie Thompson yeah. and I no. like. But I was writing about my family coming to this country, finding Super their cool. way, and all of a sudden, my losing a job paled in significance. Love that. And I know you count your family, yes. same perspective. thing. Perspective. And it's all powerful. of a sudden, I had a different perspective, and I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, God, I got to get over this. You know, for I, you. this is not the worst thing that's happened to my family in 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 my history. Right. Let it, yeah. And so it really helped me get some perspective. And then what happened? This is what was interesting. He read the story and he got to know me. And within another two weeks when we met, he said, I don't get it. This just doesn't add up. And I said, why? He said, the person who wrote this story is a fierce competitor and is determined to make a difference. And you're showing up. Tail between the legs. Yeah. And as and you're not showing up. The, the person I'm reading about and the person I'm meeting are two different people. I'm an introvert. I Even more then than I am now. And I, I wasn't talking unless spoken to. I was very polite. I was trying to fit in, make it work, keep my job, and do all this. Defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was reacting to things. And he said, you've got so much to offer. Go. But you're keeping it all bottled up inside. And, and that's where the spirit of this book started to be born because, you know, my observation and we do a little story. David Brooks from the New York Times writes about, are you living for your resume or your eulogy? Are you trying to get all the tangible things, you know, the new car, the, uh, the, the corner office? Are you living for that? Or are you living for what they're going to say about you when you're gone? And he said, you get seduced living for your resume. And I started realizing that you got to put your resume and your eulogy together. And it should be knit together with a sense of purpose that grows out of your life story, not out of all the testing and all this other stuff. It grows out of your life story because, as we see in the book, your life story is your leadership story. I, I it's was, where it comes from. I met with a young woman that doesn't work here, and she wants to go do something, and she's not leaving because she's worried that her resume is going to show she only worked at this place for six months. I was like, it's 2020. Yeah, Nobody yeah. even fucking reads resumes. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. When I, when I lost my job, it's like you were ashamed that you lost a job and you didn't tell anybody. People still are that way. And, uh, and it Stigmas was... Stigmas are real. Yeah, so you, what you, happened you with your career? Where did you get picked up? Well, I ended up going to Craft, had a good run at Craft, where I did met... Did you move to Peter? Where I met yep, Peter. Yep. Did you, uh, and did you go to Did you uh, go to Chicago? I went back to Chicago, tailed between my legs to a degree because that's where I grew up. Yep. But Kraft was a job. I, you... I had a great great job there. What, did, I ended what was up, the entry point? What brand? Uh, I was a category manager for uh, Kraft salad dressings. Mm -hmm. But I went on to, to be director of corporate strategy at Kraft. And uh, then I got recruited right after Barbarians at the Gate. Right. Uh, by KKR, I got tell, recruited. Tell everybody a little bit about This is an iconic book in the corporate world. I want some of the youngsters and entrepreneurs and outside mm -hmm. the corporate world to hear this. Tell everybody just a few seconds on that iconic book and story. It, well, this this was the, the story of the second half of the 20th century. It was the world's largest LBO at the time. It was KKR buying RJR Nabisco. RJR was a t money machine, tobacco machine. They acquired uh, Nabisco and some other food companies and uh, built this massive 
uh, business, but the handwriting was on, on the wall for the tobacco industry. And uh, uh, so business started to soften. KKR came in and, and uh, made it the world's largest LBO. They planned to flip it in five years. It took us 10. And uh, uh, they, uh, there was so much money uh, coursing through the veins of, of this company that uh, it was like the Wild West of uh, corporate spending. And this is, there were stories. Wasting. Yeah, there were stories of the chairman who's since passed uh, sending the corporate jet to pick up his dog on the East Coast to come out to Mission Hills, California for a golf tournament on the West Coast. The dog. The dog. And uh, we, had, we, had, we had a team. <laughs> He had assembled a team of the greatest athletes of all time. Oh, I know this story. Uh, the Johnny Johnny Unitas, all of them, they really had no income in their retirement. They hadn't made the money, right? And so they started. They had about thirty people on payroll who uh, lived off RJR Nabisco and showed up at events and everything else. It was a larger payroll, I believe, than the Yankees at the time. But it was the who's who of Hall of Fame land for he all loved the sports. sports and just wanted to hang out with those guys. Yeah, hang out, and you know it was a it, it worked. So uh, they it was just an amazing excess. KKR bought it. We had to sort of wind all that down because corporate governance was getting in the way. I mean, you couldn't do that some of that stuff, and uh, so Cleaned we ended up. we ended up taking a lot of cost out. I had a good run there. The last five years, I was president of Nabisco Foods running that. And then we sold that, actually, back to Kraft, who I had left. And uh, then I was recruited to go help uh, fix Campbell Soup Company, which was, I was there for a decade as CEO. And that was... Great. That was wild. I went in there and... uh, how did Headquartered that, how, in Doug, Camden. How did that, how did that feel? That was, uh, remind me, I, I apologize. Was it directly to CEO? Yeah. So yeah. how did that feel? How did it feel on the dawn of knowing you're getting offered the CEO job of one of the most iconic American, I mean, this is now your full career at this point, yeah. right? From from the early days in Parker Brothers and General from Mills. You should be and, looking for another job. That's you right. You should be cleaning right. out, clean out your desk. Did you try to, now did, I'm CEO. are you more like me? Did you try to find those two guys that wrote that review the night I'm before you? you t- yeah, I'm I would have found those fuckers. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Ronald, I got something for you. So they know, how, how did, they of know. course they Believe know. Believe me, they know. They, I know they know. Did the, uh, <laughs> Did it feel spe- was that a was that it was awesome. it was a it was a headhunter was it a headhunter? Uh, yeah, but I we had been acquired, and I they knew I was the the market knew I was not going to go back to craft. Right. So so there was, were several opportunities percolating. I ended up picking the Campbell one. Were they all CEO jobs? Or? Yeah, got it. So that's the only one I would that go done. to at that point in your career. Yeah. I get it. Was and that exciting? I had always said, you know. I was, I'm slow, so I'm not as fast as you. But I had always said I want to be a CEO by the time I'm 49. And, uh, well, it's ironic. and I was 49 when it happened. This you'll find funny, Doug. I speak fast. My energy's fast. But I'm actually wildly slow. Like, even this company I'm running now, uh, you know, when we met way back when for some more, this has been built really to buy brands. I'm yeah. far more KKR, far more private you. equity than I am agency. Yeah. Like, I'm actually going slow. The energy's high. I would argue that you, 49 is a pretty young needs, age at that time of year yeah. of that era to be the CEO of something like Hamels. Yeah, yeah. Well, that it was, was fast. It was. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, it what was. was the biggest, what was the biggest challenge with that well, kind of family? There's a lot of challenges going. I ha- happen to have enough knowledge to know like the Campbell's family. Di- like there's some dynamics the, there. The family owned half the company and they were five families because it was third generation. You know, yep. multiple tricky. generations. That's right, tricky. And uh, we were headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey. Challenge. 75,000 people, 70 murders a year. And uh, we uh, and we were being we were running. It was a canned soup company. I mean, our product had been invented in the prior century, and was unchanged. And I was saying, I was talking to our folks, and I said, "Well, don't we need to evolve?" And they said, "You don't understand. We can run canned soup faster on our lines than anybody else." You're like, but- and I said, "But you know, but don't we need more?" And they said, "But but we run our canned soups really fast." 
and uh, so we we evolved. But uh, the the company. What's the biggest is, highlight for you personally in that decade? If I'm saying to you in that ten year window, hot take. You know, please. I hit stride. You know, we talked earlier about your resume and your eulogy. That came together for me. Mm. The, I showed up more authentically. During that era. In in that era. Actually, the last five years at Nabisco, I started to mature. I found my sea legs. I developed the courage of my convictions that I probably hadn't had before. Love that. But being challenged at K, by KKR all the time yeah, yeah. and the people around there. Got five years in, I sort of hit stride and said, you know, I can do this. Good for you. And then, and then so at Nabisco and then at Campbell, I hit my stride and... That I, I, it became one. You know what I do today. I live from my resume, but I very much it's in harmony with the things I hope people say about me someday. Talk talk to me about the book, uh, and talk to me about the awesome Amy who has a big uh, title in the book well, here. And I'm, I'm, Amy, I'm looking and at the it. awesome Amy is is truly awesome. I'll tell you, I'm a 68 year old white guy. I've heard, and uh, and I'm writing this book, and I would write it. Like a sixty-eight-year-old <laughs> white guy. Respect. And uh, and and I, the book is designed. and We'll talk about it in a minute. To be approachable for anyone. Right. And I needed help. And Amy's a thirty-something gifted writer. She writes all the social. She's editor in chief for Conant Leadership. She writes all of our social media content. And what is Conant Leadership for everybody? Uh, excuse me. What's Conant Leadership? It's it's what we run to. Uh, to promote uh, leadership that works in the 21st century because most of the models Is it a consulting business for everybody who's watching? Is it a consulting business? Is it We don't do education? any consulting. We don't make money. I yep. don't take a salary. Uh, we charge for a few things to cover our costs. If we more than cover our costs, we give it away. And we've been doing play. this now for like seven years. Good for you. And, uh, and, and we're, we're loving it. Who, we're in it for all the right Is the book reasons. out? The book just came out yesterday. Congratulations. Who do you feel like this is going to hit most right in the kind of chest? This can hit anybody from my kids who mm -hmm. are 33, 35, and 38 mm -hmm. on up. And that could actually, I could actually work with, uh, with college students. The beauty of this book is there is no one right way to lead. You, you know, right. And uh, if I talk about your leadership story is your life story, your life story is your leadership story, excuse me, your life story is unique, Snowflake. and you should lead in a unique way. There are some timeless principles that you should apply, which we talk about in the book, but this book is designed for you to create your, create your own blueprint. You, yep. anybody in this room, and it will all be different. I have probably, because I'm older, I have thousands of books. I Probably over a thousand books in the office. And there are a thousand books that tell you how you ought to lead. Yep. And none of them resonate with me completely. They're good, a good idea here, good idea there. Uh, so what we decided to do was write a book that helped people figure out how to lead in a way that worked for them. How much is relationship with adversity and losing, self-esteem, self-awareness, how, how many of these, you know? Well, that's all, I mean, it's all part of it. This is complicated. If it was not complicated, Everybody it would have been it. figured out already. So, you know, and... The key to this book is, and all those other books, uh, it takes, it's like a diet. After the holidays, you have your diet, you say, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds, and here we go. My wife and I are gonna start a diet. We last about two weeks, and we say, this is never gonna work. It doesn't fit in our life. And the, the way we wrote this book was, it has to nest perfectly, the change process, perfectly in your cockamamie life, the way it exists today. Anybody in your office, yep. all of whom, Everybody feels swamped. Hundred percent swamped, right? It's unbelievable. And they say, "How do I fit this?" I watch in? people who have one hour's worth of work feel yeah. like they're swamped, and I want to kick them in the face. <laughs> no, it's true. It's the human spirit. Yeah. People fill their bucket with what? Uh, let stuff. me make, let me make fun of myself. I thought I was the hardest working guy going at twenty seven. I laugh at that kid. Well, you were pretty hard working. I was. I knew fair you enough. Then. <laughs> but, but but really, you know, yeah. you hit different gears, yeah, hitting that's strides, true. right? That's true. It is around happiness or what you're supposed to be doing. Amy, jump in here for a second. I just want to ask. Go ahead. Don't be scared. I just want to ask you a quick question from your perspective, because I think it really matters. It can help. You know, from your perspective, as as this book was written, what what stood out to you? What was an aha for you? Maybe going through the process, which I think sometimes happens, or what was your ambition? Or as you were listening and debating and and conjuring up with Doug, what when you now look at this as a finished product, 
where do you go with like, oh, I'm really glad this happened through the process or I'm excited to see this uh, group of people absorb this and I'm excited, like some random thoughts on that front. Yeah, so I think one of the epiphanies was anchoring this story in that moment of Doug getting fired because it brings somebody with such gravitas down to earth, yes. makes them relatable. Yes. And it really is the story of the worst day in somebody's life. How Becoming do you get the from best. that day and how do you get there? Yes. And it's a practical guide. So when you look at a story that big, it can feel too big to yes. be approachable. So that's how we also had kind of the epiphany to make it really practical. People that I talk to my age also feel swamped, whether they only have an hour of work or 70 hours. Yep. And they're saying, well, how, I don't feel ready. I, I need to wait for the perfect conditions to get started on a change process. When am I gonna feel ready? You're never gonna feel ready. So Amy, this is much, for you how whenever. Much, how much do you feel that is people's inability to have a relationship with other people's judgment? I'm sorry, say that one more time. I need sure. to think about that. Well, I think it's, it's a, like to your point, and I couldn't agree with you more, like, people come up with enormous amounts of counterpoints to why this is a time to do something that would mm -hmm. make them happier and more successful. Mm -hmm. And so it's something I've been thinking about my whole life. I think one of the great gifts that I was given is immigrant, grew up with yeah. very little, and then on top of it, which is rare for immigrants, bad student, right? Mm -hmm. that is, that, that's an added element, which very early on gave me a relationship with losing and being an outsider that made me very comfortable with not worrying about people's judgment. And I observe and I'm like, right, they're scared to quit their good job because they're unhappy because they're worried about their mom's judgment, their husband's judgment, their best friend's judgment. Mm -hmm. In what you just said, how much have you observed, what's your hypothesis on how much of this is actually grounded in people's inability to deal with other people's judgment? Yeah, that's a really good point. And you're actually lucky that you failed early Agreed. because you got comfortable with Agreed. it. Agreed. There's a lot of people, especially who ascend to the levels of leadership that the leaders Doug's talking to, where they're used to being really type A and Correct. high achieving. And they don't, they're not comfortable Correct. with something that's imperfect. So the message in this book is forget perfection. Throw it out the window. I hate it's not going to be perfect. Perfect you just have to get going. Perfection is a disguise for not wanting to do. Absolutely, it becomes it becomes an excuse to just not even start, 100%, yeah. I love that. And what Amy's engineered in here is this, uh, you can start right now with what you have, with what you've got right away, and within a week you can start to behave in is a way that works for you. Let's get one question in before we wrap up and then I'll give yeah. you the floor to give some thought to the last things we wanna say before we head out of here. Yeah, it just makes sense. You know, it's really funny. Podcast form, book form, you know, you know. Ultimately, I think why I wasn't a good student is my relationship with reading. I was never diagnosed, but it's clear to me. Um, you know, I love that people learn in different formats. Yes, I love that. Who's this? Adam. Adam. Adam, don't blow your only chance. Here comes one more. Adam. Oh, I hope we get a voice message so I can leave. Here. Hello, this is Adam. Adam, this is Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> How's it going, dude? It's going How's quite it going, well. Gary? Say hello to Doug and Amy. Hey, Adam, what's going on? Hey, Doug and Amy. Oh, it's going pretty well. How are you? Good. What's your question, brother? You know, I uh, I just I, I know have done some research in the past. I'm actually writing a a blog right now. It's kind of funny that I'm even on this, but I'm writing a blog right now, and it's about just talking about employees and clients and just showing appreciation and specifically how to write the the perfect thank you note and i know a little bit of, of doug's history and how he has uh written i believe over thirty thousand thank you notes and i just kind of wanted to pick his brain as far as like the impact of just simply showing appreciation and being genuine and like what that means and how do you do that and any suggestions with that and yeah Hey, well, go to conantleadership.com and we'll help you even more. But, <laughs> but, let, me, let, me, but, but let me tell you, uh, I was an introvert. Doug, hold on. First, you have to thank this guy for knowing that history about you. Well, everybody, I'm surprised you don't, Gary. You know what? No, I, I, got, I, I did I, know about I, the thank I, you I, notes. I, yeah. is, the number, is the number in the range? Yeah, he's, he's right. He's I, right. I, I did know big time yeah, on the thank yeah. you notes. I didn't know it was to, I mean, that is well, scale. Well, you know, and, and, and Gary, thank you. When, when I... Uh, Adam, thank you. When I lost yeah, my welcome. job, my ex my outplacement counselor said, "You're going to be a horrible interview. You're too shy. You're too introverted. You got to figure out a way to have a signature practice mm. to get a job." 
and he Thank said, you. figure it out. So I started, I'd come here, I'd meet 10 people, I'd get all their names uh, while I was interviewing. I would go to the coffee shop next door, I would handwrite a note to each of them. I would then walk it back to the coffee, to the front desk, give it to the receptionist, and say, could you deliver these today? I did that everywhere I went. Wow. And I started this Powerful. practice of reaching out in a personal way. It doesn't have to be much. Receptionists had never received a personal thank you note in their life from somebody calling on the building. That's amazing. And so I started doing that. And then I went Powerful. to work at Campbell. And even in Campbell, which was hemorrhaging, eight out of 10 things being done were right. We had to make some real tough decisions, let go 300 of the top 350 leaders. <laughs> never been done in Fortune 500 history. At the same time, mm -hmm. we had all these people doing good work. So I started writing 10 to 20 short notes a day to employees. I was commuting two and a half hours each way from New Jersey down to Camden, from Morris County down mm -hmm. to Camden. I started uh, reading all the stuff that was going on in the company, and I would write notes to these folks. 10 to 20 a day, six days a week for a decade. I was, when I was retiring, the person from Forbes said, how many of these, I'm hearing all about all these notes from everybody. How many notes have you written? I said, I don't know. So we did the math during the interview. We did the math and figured out just the Campbell employees, I'd written 30,000 notes. We only had 20,000 employees. Wherever you went in the world, we were in 38 countries. We were marketed in 125 countries. Wherever you went in the world in a cubicle, if I was to walk out, you would see a note, for, handwritten note from me That's amazing. in just about every person's cubicle somewhere. You know what's amazing about that? Adam, any, any parting shots? Because I'm going to wrap up here, but thank you for that. <laughs> That's awesome. Adam, keep, gotta... make it personal and keep it short. Awesome. Thank you so much. You got it, brother. You know, it's funny. A lot of people don't know this, but in my transition from the wine business to the tech world, I reply to every single tweet from 2007 to 2011, period. Anybody who replied to me. And and I think that's, I, I mean, it, yeah. but it's the same yeah. game you played. Yeah, it was, it, you know, right, right. It, it, it makes, it was, con and it context, right? Twitter. Yeah. You know, like sending a note to Amy and be like, I liked your black and white jacket that you wore in the office today. Like when you actually are paying attention, when you actually know a little something, it's subtle little things It really, really, well, it's I listening, it's you, listening. I gotta tell you though, the notes I wrote were not gratuitous, I like your jacket. They were, you delivered the business on plan, under budget, or nice job with the diversity network. Every note I sent was reaffirming our company strategy Respect. and was talking performance. But you know, the, the theme was, I'm gonna be tough-minded on standards, we let a lot of people go, but I'm gonna be tender-hearted with people. And the people that were getting the work done, they heard from me too. I love that. So it's, it's, this is not about- Mine would've been like, Amy, good job, we got the pages in, and I also liked your jacket. Well, <laughs> I didn't I'm wanna, kidding, I'm I kidding. wanted no mistakes. I, I respect want, that, no, I, I respect that. I worry that people think, oh, it, we're just gonna hold and Doug, hands it's, and it's back. It's, but by That's the way, not it. by the way, it's back to the blueprint. Yeah. It's back to 11,000 books. Yeah. It's, I would have done that, and you would have done this, and that's the biggest punchline. The biggest fear I have right now is in my popularity growth that people are gonna try to be like me. I'm an enigma. I was, I was in outer space. I grew up in a very different, yeah, you I grew up, I'm a first, I was born in the old country. I'm more similar to everybody's grandfather than I am to them. I'm a different animal. Yeah. Don't do it like me. Don't do it like you. Do it like us in our buying into who we were and how we could do it. Yeah. It's, it's your story, you write it. 100%. It's not our story. That's it. And all these leadership books are, here's my story and here's how you should do it. It's Forget wrong, about that. I'm with you, it's, it's wrong. wrong. Now, now, if you're the kind of learner that learns from other people's examples, that's why you went on to read those books, because you were able to get a little here, a little there, at a 15, 20 bucks a pop, and if you're a quick reader, you can get value. But you, well, it's there, a framework. There are people you can learn from. You know, uh, I, I, I met Stephen Covey when he was Stephen Covey. Uh, you know, he yeah. was he was advising presidents, and I and he, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Always. And he had a profound influence on me. So did Neil McKenna, who was my outplacement counselor. Yep. Right time, right place. Right human. I mean, there are people to learn from. Always. But you have to listen to your inner voice. Love. And what our observation is, most people don't know their inner voice. They not they Agreed. haven't reflected on it. They or don't they suppress it. it or they fear it. Yeah. Because it well, doesn't that's even fit better. in. Because yeah, right. they fear it, because they hear it, but they don't see it fitting into the narrative that has been forced on them. Right. That well said. We could have used you when we <laughs> the book. Where were you?
you when I needed you. I'm here right now when it matters. <laughs> watch this. Everybody who's watching, go to Amazon or your local bookstore, barnesandnobles.com and pick up the blueprint. Doug, Amy, thank you so much. All right.